God is teaching us how to step out. And I said, we're not trying to do this based on what other people have done. Let's look at it on based on how Jesus did it. And I believe that Jesus elevated. I believe that Jesus stepped up, as it were, every time after time after time. But I knew this. When I introduce a subject matter like this, most people will have a pushback toward it because they say, well, that's Jesus. He's the son of God. I'm not like him. And in fact, you're just like him, and he was just like you. I want to refresh your, your memory in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 16 and 17. This is our foundational scripture. We also know that the Son did not come to help angels. He came to help the descendants of Abraham. Come on, somebody raise your hand and say, I'm one of those descendants. <laughs> so you'll realize that what did Jesus do? He came to help you. He came to help you. Now, let's go to the next verse. Verse 17, therefore, it was necessary for him, Jesus, to be made in every respect what? Come on, say it out loud. Jesus is just like you. He was just like you. He was all human. I am not taking away it from the deity because we know that his conception came by the Holy Ghost. But I'm saying to you, and he was all man or mankind just like you and I. Therefore, it was necessary, necessary the scripture says, to be made in every respect like us. Jesus was made just like you. Amen? I was laughing. I think about last time Rodney was talking about the, the children and, and all of the things that he had to go through when they got sick. Jesus had his, he had to have his diapers changed. He had to be fed. Jesus did everything just like you did. Just like us. And here's the point here. His brothers, and, just like us, his brothers and sisters, so that he could be our merciful and faithful high priest before God, then he could offer, he could offer a sacrifice, last part of that, a sacrifice, last part of that scripture for us, please. A sacrifice that would take away the sins of the people. And we know that the sacrifice is him giving his life for the sins of the people. But he was just like us. He was just like us. Now, where we went from there is to show that Jesus grew, the Bible says he grew in what? Wisdom. Now, we stop there to say, if, like some people suppose, well, Jesus knew everything. That's why I can't do it, because, you know, Jesus knew everything. No, he didn't. Not according to the Scripture. Because if you've got all wisdom, you can't grow in any wisdom. Anybody following that? If you've got it all and you know it all, there's no room for growth. Anybody ever seen somebody who thought they knew it all? And you realize no room for growth in that. That person is, they just know it. And then you say, well, just keep on living. You're going to see. Let's go to Luke 2.52. And just to refresh your memory in this, here's what the scripture says. You read it out loud, please. Go ahead, everyone. Read it out loud. He grew in this. So then after we looked at that, we then said, well, how did this growth take place? What did Jesus do in order to grow in these areas? Because that's apparently what you and I must do in order to grow in Christ. And we began to realize that we looked at him at an age that we believe is approximately 12 years of age. Jesus was lost. Though we stopped there for a moment because Jesus was lost for three days from his parents. He wasn't lost. But for three days. I looked at Tanya just a moment ago and she could not imagine Matthew being gone for three days. 
But for three days, Mary and Joseph found him. Where did they find him? In the temple. What was he doing? Sitting with some people who were mature. Some people that were talking to him about, at that time, they were just manuscripts. But the Bible. And he sat there. The scripture says he listened. The scripture says, and he asked some questions. And then it tells us, and he began to grow. You know what was happening? When he sat and didn't come in with an attitude that I know everything and nobody can tell me nothing. He said he learned some things. He began to ask some questions about some things. And he began to grow. What was he doing? Jesus was discovering who he was. I believe that his mother certainly, and perhaps his father, were inputting some things into Jesus because when they found him, his mother would ask the question, you know, we've been worried, we've been looking for him. He said, Mom, didn't you know? Didn't you know? I think he, he had, he, he's reminding her, you have told me that I was going to discover who my father was. Didn't you know, he said to her, that I must be about what? My father's business. Jesus grew. And then we went on in the latter part of last week. I tried to share with you from this perspective. I said, when Jesus grew in wisdom, every time he met a situation in life, he also, you also realized that he met it again. How many of you know the devil will come back at you sometimes with the same thing? We learned that in a sense when Jesus went and he went out into the wilderness. And you know what happened. He prayed. He fasted. When he came back, the Bible says he was being tempted by the devil. One of the things, let me back up just a little bit. If you are growing in wisdom, if you're growing in stature, and if you're growing in favor with God, it's going to take you to a place of deep prayer. Let me just say that again. If you are truly growing in wisdom, you realize that there's an endless supply of this that's going to come, but it's coming as a result of getting before God. Spending some time in your secret closet, talking with God. Prayer is intensified in your life. How many of you realize that when Jesus got ready to go to the cross, how intense the prayer was? The Bible says that prayer in that point was so intense, it was like blood. It literally was blood coming out. Intense prayer. Intense prayer. This is one of the, the things that I've learned over the 40-some years that I've been walking with the Lord. You've got to intensify your prayer. I don't care how old you get. I don't care how long you think you've been in the walk. The more you walk with God, the more you realize you're going to have to bend your knee and talk with God. You're going to see some things, and some things are going to meet you that have met you before, and you're going to have to say, I recognize that. And I know what to do. I recognize that spirit, and I know it's not the spirit of God, and I know what to do. Look, this is what I started to talk to you about when Jesus met some things. I just used water. Come on, you know that Jesus met water. And the very first miracle happened when he met water, because water, he said to water, change. Change. There are some things when you meet it, you know some change needs to come. Come on, how many of you know when you meet yourself, you realize that some change needs to come? Look, you're going to meet self again one day too, and you're going to have to say, self, I'm about to speak to you, because that's what happened with Jesus. Because when the water, he met water again, it was a storm, and then you know what Jesus did? He spoke to it. Somebody say, speak to it. Speak you, to there it. are times where you, you're going to meet yourself, and you're going to have to speak to yourself too. 
There are things where you're going to meet in this life that you're going to have to speak to it. But you notice that? That's an elevation there. There's an elevation happening here. At the first time, he, it's a change that happens. At the second time, there's a speaking to it. And then he met water again. And you know what he did? He's walking on it. He's walking on it. Somebody says, the devil is where? Under my feet. You ought to walk on it. Come on. Jesus met death. The first time he met death, there's a man named Jarius, and his daughter is ill. And, and, and Jesus goes to the house, and she's been dead for a few hours. Look, the, they, his servant has already come and said, don't even bother the master because she's already dead. And Jesus looked at him and said, do you remember what I said? Can you only believe? See, you've got to remember what God said. The circumstance, the situation that you see and that you, your emotions that you're feeling may just cause your mind to go tilt. But this is why you walk in what? The Spirit. See, Jesus was walking in the Spirit. When Jesus went to the wilderness, he was in the Spirit. He was led there by the Spirit of God. What's the wilderness? The wilderness is going to a place where you ain't going to get no answers until you pray. The wilderness is a place where you don't know what to do, but your eyes are on him. Here's the second time Jesus meets death. When he meets death now, it's a man by the name, or actually it's a, it's a woman who's taking her son to the graveyard, right? And Jesus says, was that your only son? And she says, that's my only son. Jesus says, he raised him up. Next time he meets death, third time he meets death, it's a man by the name of Lazarus. You know him. And, and, and Lazarus has been in the grave now not a few hours. But for what? Literally four days. And what did Jesus say? Come forth. Do you know Jesus is still going to meet death again? It's going to be his own death. And this time, Jesus is going to step on death and say, Death, where is your... Come on. Anybody know where I'm going here? Every time Jesus is elevating, he's stepping up. You and I, God is saying, you've got to learn how to step up your game. I don't know about you. I played a little bit of sport. And, and there are times where, you know, we were getting beat by people that we weren't supposed to be getting beat by. Anybody ever play and you realize, I'm not supposed to be getting beat by. Those are scrubs. Come on, the devil is the scrub. The devil is the one under your feet. He's not supposed to be whipping you behind every day. He may look like he's out front, but you are more than a conqueror. You are the one who can do what? All things through Christ who strengthens you, but you have to step up your game. He might have thrown a punch. You might have even fallen down. Even seven times you fell down. But the Bible says you ought to what? Get back up and step up your game. Elevate. But we still haven't got there. What was he doing? How is he? He's, he's getting some wisdom. We understand this. The Holy Spirit now is whom Jesus is listening to. He ain't listen to all of his buds. He ain't listen to all a bunch of people just filling your ears with nothingness. He's listening to the Holy Ghost. Everything that he's doing, he's being Holy Ghost led, Holy Ghost guided, Holy Ghost directed, and Holy Ghost comforted too. Amen. Same thing that the Holy Ghost will do for you. He'll lead you. He'll guide you. He'll direct you. He'll comfort you. He'll help you to understand what is truly the will of God and not the will of man. Amen? Amen. Sometimes we get caught up with the will of man. How many of you know you got a lot of people speaking to your ears? But he says, my sheep will what? You'll know his voice. You'll know the voice of the Holy Ghost. And the voice of the stranger, the Bible says, don't follow it. So the essence of what I'm saying is every miracle ascended the previous miracle that Jesus had performed. 
every miracle. Follow it out. Study it out for yourself. Look at healing. You'll realize in every healing, something even greater was being done. Come on. How many of you remember what Jesus said to you and I about stepping up our game? He said, what? The works that I do? You will what? Do? And you'll do what? Greater. In other words, God says, if you follow my plan, you'll be able to step it up. You'll be able to step it up. You'll be able to step it up. And I, I, I'm telling you, folks, just, just because you see something down doesn't mean that it's out. You know, a few weeks ago, I had a, a clip where a, a boxer by the name of Buster Douglas, come on, Mike Tyson, Mike Buster down. But who won? Who won? Who got back up and took out a foe that nobody thought, they, they thought Mike Tyson was invincible. And he said, you know, that little guy, man, he just, but see, ain't nobody ever stepped it up with him. Fear was really dominating most of his opponents. And that's how the devil wants to paralyze you. Fear. If I can intimidate you enough. You know, when I play sports and basketball especially, he said, you know, if I can get in that guy's head. So sometimes you look at him and say, he's pretty good. But if I can get in his head, if I can get him to think this way rather than have confidence in who he is. See, Jesus, because of the Holy Spirit, had confidence in who he was and what he could do through God. And that's where we have to be. You've got to be confident. Say, I am more than a conqueror. I am more than a conqueror. You've got to see that every day of your life. Whatever, you are con being, whatever is confronting you, you've got to say, I, I, I can, hey, I'm the head. I'm not the tail. I'm going to stop for just a moment because there's somebody that's here this morning that's got a testimony. I'm just sitting on the front row here. You've got a testimony, don't you? Okay, come on and share it. Give me a mic real quick. Somebody help me. Grab a mic for me. This is part, it's part of the message. He <laughs> said, so did you pre-plan it? No, I haven't pre-planned anything. Some of you all, all, out here, you've got a, a, a testimony too. Because your testimony testifies of what Jesus has done, not what you can do. I've got a testimony. Jesus has done some amazing, miraculous things in my life. Go ahead. Well, what a wonderful name it is. It is. The name of Jesus. Um, I wanted to share this, but I wanted to, before I share my testimony, I wanted to make sure that all the praise and honor and glory goes to Jesus, to our Father, to our, our Daddy, our Papa, and then the Holy Spirit, who's our uh, power source. And I even wanted to thank my angels in all of this. Uh, last year, um, I fell three times last year. First time I was in the classroom, I went to tell Elijah goodbye, and he and Nathaniel saw me, and one's yelling Nammy, and the other's yelling Grammy, and they uh, came over and just kind of rushed the grandmother and just rushed it, and before I knew it, I went down. Sarah said it was the funniest thing because she said it was, I, she, it was like I went down in slow motion. And I told her, I said, because as I felt some arms here and just kind of laying me down. And I got down there on the floor, and the kids are laughing, you know, because usually I don't get down on the floor and play, and they're just laughing and everything. And I'm thinking, help me, Jesus. <laughs> and so I said, you lying devil, there is no truth in you. I, the peace of God's all over me, and peace means nothing missing, nothing broken. And so I, Sarah said, you need some help? I said, no, I, I, I can get up. So anyway, I got up. About three or four days later, I'm in the uh, uh, multi-purpose room and I'm cleaning because I do morning care and I like to clean and disinfect and everything and uh, my foot got on the end of the tricycle and the tricycle went out and next thing I knew I go down on both knees both hands and then roll on this hip and this shoulder and I'm down there and I'm like seeing stars and I said Jesus I said, devil, you are a liar. There is no truth in you. I said, no weapon formed against me should prosper. I said, Isaiah 54, 17, if anybody wants to know, no weapon formed against me is going to prosper. Every tongue that rises up against me in judgment, God, you're going to condemn it and show it to be wrong. And I said, and I, I mean, I was hurting. I was, I was, that's the truth. I was in pain. And I said, in Jesus' name, I will get up. I will do morning care. I will do chapel. 
in Jesus' name, I will go shopping. I will buy my bathing suit. I will go walk in the water. I will go home. I will pack my bag, and tomorrow morning I will be on a plane, and I will fly to Houston. And I said, that's it, in Jesus' name. And I rolled over on these wonderful knees, and I got up, and the first thing I did was I bent down and I touched the floor, and then I raised my hand and said, hallelujah, and that was it. Pain was gone. I said, thank you, Jesus. I said, devil, you are a liar, and there is no truth in you. And I said, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. So I get on the plane, and I go to Houston, celebrate my granddaughter's birthday. Never missed a one, not going to. She turned 14 last year. And so um, we're there, and so we decided to go out shopping. So um, the way their townhome, or where they had the townhome, uh, Meredith had to pull in, and uh, Philip had to back in. So the, you know, the, the center part, they could open up the doors and get out. And so Meredith got to, gets out, and she walks in. And then um, Decree was still sitting there talking to Philip, my son. And so I get out, and I walk in the, the back of the car. I didn't see this little puddle of water there from, you know, condensation, you know, from the A.C., I hit that thing with my flip-flops. The only thing I saw was two feet, and my tailbone went down on that concrete, my back, and this arm, and all I heard was crunch, like, like you're crunching crackers to put in soup. I mean, I just heard crunch. And I said, Jesus, because the name, you know, Jesus came to seek and to save the lost. Jesus, when you call on the name of the Lord, he, you shall be saved. That word saved is a Greek word. It's sozo, S-O-Z-O. Saved, healed, delivered, made whole, set free, prosperous. He did everything for us. So you're calling on it. What a wonderful name it is. I'm so glad you sang that song this morning. And so I'm just laying there, and then Decree gets out of the car, and she said, Crammy, what happened? And I said, girl, I don't know. Next thing I know, I hear Philip putting it in reverse, and he's coming back towards me. And I'm laying on the floor of the, of the uh, garage. Thank you. And so I just said, Jesus, as loud as I could. The next thing I heard was car horn blowing, a man selling, stop, stop, stop. And then Philip tells me later that... Um, this man came right up in his little driveway, flashing the lights, yelling stop, and, and jumped out of the car and made it past Philip and got to me before Philip could get to me. And he came, bent over and he looked at me and it, this sweet, gentle sound. He said, are you okay? And I said, yes, I am because the devil's a liar. There's no truth in him. <laughs> and I said, I said, and I have the peace of God, which means nothing missing, nothing broken. I said, I am fine in the name of Jesus. I have called on the name of the Lord and I shall be saved. And he looked at me and he said, well, I'm glad you're okay. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, and, and so meanwhile, Philip comes out and he's standing there and I look over my son and he's like as white as a sheet. He says, Mom. What did I almost do? And I said, honey, you didn't, it, it didn't, it didn't, the weapon was formed, but it didn't prosper. It didn't prosper. It was formed, but it didn't prosper. And so the man looked at me again, just so sweetly. He, says, he said, are you okay? This is the second time. And I said, I am fine. And so Philip gets behind me, and the man gets in front of me, and they put their hands under my arms, and they just very slowly raised me up. I look back, and here's the bumper right here. That's where the bumper was, and my head was right there. That's where the bumper was. I did. <laughs> Lots of times. <laughs> Still thanking him. And so, um, you know, I get up, and the man says, uh, and the third time, and he puts his hand on my shoulder this time, and he says, are you Okay. And I said, yes, I am. I said, look. And I went down again, and I touched the floor, and I raised my hands and said, hallelujah. And I said, no weapon formed against me is going to prosper. And I go through my, <laughs> my repertoire of scriptures, okay, because the word works. Pastor Keith's telling us to get in the word so the word can get in us. Yep. So out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth's going to speak. Stuff's going to happen. And when the stuff happens, the word's got to come out. You can't say, oh, no, oh, gee. Oh my, oh whatever, no, lion devil. I mean, lion devil. 
Okay. So we get up, and I, I walk in, and um, Meredith says, she's clueless. She doesn't know what happened. So I go on up to the bedroom, which is, I'm staying in Decree's bedroom, and I get undressed, and I put my jammies on, and I sit there on the side of the bed, and I just start to cry. And I just cry, and I just cry. And I think, and I, I was praising God, and I said, thank you, Jesus, that my son does not have to live with the fact for the rest of his life that he killed his mother. Mm-hmm. That he, you know, that I'm not in some body cast somewhere, and I'm not in this, and I was thinking of all these different things, and I'm just praising him, and I'm thanking him for it, and I'm just thanking him for it. And, and you know, um, Hosanna, uh, integrity, uh, lift him up, can't stop praising his name. Okay, Ron Canoli. That was me. I could not stop praising the name of Jesus. I mean, I praised his name. I cried for about at least an hour. Philip came up. He says, Mommy, he said, are you okay? I said, these are really happy tears. Yep. I'm fine. I'm, I'm just, I'm, these are happy tears. And so he said, I don't know what to say. I said, praise, say praise God. Say thank you, Jesus. Thank you that the word works. You know, you stand on the word and the word works for you. And so he just said, okay. So then, you know, went down later, had dinner. The next day, I'm renting a, a, a SUV to drive up to Fort Worth, uh, Dallas-Fort Worth Airport, to pick up my sister-in-law. She was coming in. She's our Ancestry.com person in our family, and she needed more information on my grandfather. So she said, you're there. I'll fly in. And so we drove over to Paris, Texas, and stayed there a week to find out stuff. So anyway, I get in. I, we go there to get the car. And they give me this truck, and it's, it's high. You know, I'm short, short legs, so it's really strange to get up, up, up in this truck. And I figure, well, praise God, you know, hallelujah. So on the map, Waco is, is halfway. So I stop at Waco. I see what Chip and Joe have done, went to the restaurant, you know, saw the silos, talked to so many Christians. I couldn't be there. There were so many Christians there. We were just talking and praising God. So the next day, had breakfast at Chip's restaurant, or bre- his restaurant, or breakfast place, Went on up to uh, Fort Worth. I'm driving, maybe two hours. And all of a sudden, I see this cloud come in. And I'm far enough away. I can see above the cloud, there's the sun. And below it, it's just as black as black can be. And you saw the rain coming down. And I hate to drive in the rain. And I'm riding up to this thing. And all of a sudden, I just said, and use your example. (laughs) I said, you know, Jesus spoke to the winds and the waves and it said, peace be still, and that storm stopped. I said, he's in me. I'm speaking to it. And I said, therefore, peace be still and, you know, be gone in Jesus' name. Instantly, quicker than it's, him, it's taken me to give this testimony, that cloud left. And it was dry and the sun was out. I mean, it was gone. It was instant. And I'm driving along, and I said, oh, you're good. You are good. I said, man, this is Jeremiah 112. You will hasten your word to perform it. I said, thank you, Jesus. So I'm driving up, and I'm on, you know, these, some of the roads in Texas are so crazy. This is like seven, eight lanes. I mean, it's just, and they're passing you like you're standing still, and I'm going 70. And the, the, the thing was 75, I think, was the, uh, the, uh, the speed limit. And so anyway... I stayed in the third lane so I could just be out of the people's ways that were going all these different ramps. And so um, it's, I, I'm about 10 miles away, so I figured, well, I better get over. So I get over. I look. There's nobody behind me. I get over in the right lane, and um, all of a sudden there's this 18-wheeler beside me, and he was getting real close, real close. Next thing I know, he runs me off the road. Now, he doesn't run me off the road into the shoulder because he's on the shoulder. He runs me off the road into a ramp that has barrels there that is closed. So I hit the brakes. I'm calling on the name of Jesus. I hit the brakes. I hit a barrel. I go around the barrel. The next thing I know, I am on so much rubble and so much debris. It was just like trash cans. I mean, trash uh, dumpsters just poured stuff down on this road. And... uh, I'm running over cones, I'm running over barrels, I'm running over, and they're hitting up the side of the car. I'm bouncing around like I'm not even got a seatbelt on. And I've got white knuckles. I mean, I'm just, and I'm just saying, Jesus, 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 Jesus. I am calling on the name of the Lord. And so I'm running over all this stuff, and I mean, I am bouncing. And I thought, you know, later I thought, that's why I had that big truck that I could barely get up in because I guess I needed this 
facing the wheels or something. I don't know. And I'm bouncing along, and all of a sudden, I see pallets. And they were stacked two and three high. And so I go and I hit these things, and I'm still, I'm not, I'm not slamming on the brakes. I'm just pressing the brakes because there wasn't enough road for the tires to hit to make me stop. It was all debris. I kept sliding back and forth. And so I'm just saying, Jesus, that's the only thing I know to say is Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. And so I'm just going down this thing, and I'm hitting these pallets, and these, this car is crunching these pallets. And all of a sudden I say, y'all would know what I'm talking about, these wooden pallets, okay, that you get food on and everything. And I'm saying, oh, God, no nails, no blowouts, no blowout tire, you know, because, you know, a lot of times crazy things happen when you get a blowout tire. And I'm there crunching, and then all of a sudden the thought comes, the road's going to end. There's no road. That's why they put all this stuff here. There's no road. And I thought, oh, Jesus. And I instantly thought of a, of a testimony of Talad uh, Muhammad's when he was here years ago, either this building or the last building. He was in an airport, and he was on the bottom level, and where he needed to be was the top level. And so... And he's just, and he couldn't, and he didn't know how to get up there. There was the last call for his flight, and he had a big meeting waiting for him, you know, at, the, at his destination. And so he looked over, and there were steps, and there were steps going up the, this, this wall. And so he ran up the steps and ran through the, 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 the gate there, and he gave his ticket. He said, I'm supposed to be on this plane. And the lady says, you know, the concourse was empty because everybody's on the plane. And she, he says, uh, she said, where'd you, come? where'd you come from? He said, up the steps. And she said, what steps? He said, the steps over there. The railing's closed. He walks over. There's no steps. There's no steps. He just ran up steps. So I said, Jesus, if you can make talent steps, you can make me a road. Make me a road. Just make me a road. Make me a road. And I'll finally, I got to where the rubble had stopped. And I mean, I'm crunching these, these pallets like they're nothing, like they're made out of toothpicks in this car. And I mean, stuff is coming up alongside of the car. And I thought, God, they have my, they have my credit card. My credit card can't buy a new truck. You know, I mean, Jesus. And I'm just calling out the name of Jesus. And so I get to where the rubble stopped. And um, there was this road. And I saw the road, and it connected way over to the other side. I didn't know how high up I was. When I left the, the road, I left the dirt. I was on, I was up high. I don't know where, because there was like six or seven layers of just cars and, and um, uh, those ramps going over, because I think it was, it was so close to the airport. There were so many roads coming into the airport, you know, and they were just doing that. I get... I I'm, I'm finally got down to about 40, 30, and then 20 miles an hour, and I hit this, this part here. And I said, thank you, Jesus, for my road. Thank you, Jesus, for my road. Because, see, this road had no guardrails, and it had no lines. So I had to stay right in the center. And I stayed right in the center, and I went real slow over that, and I got to the other side. And when I got to the other side, it didn't have a ramp that went up or went down. It just stopped like an intersection. I thought, Jesus. I said, thank you. So I turned and I I went up to, um, got on the highway, got to the airport, got out, looked at my car. Holy Spirit said, turn around and look back. There's not one mark on that car. Not one mark. Not even the wheel. Not even the wheels were dirty. Nothing. So, last week he's preaching, and he says, "When you grow in Christ, you will be able to see miracles." So he's standing here preaching, and what I saw up on that screen. Can you put that slide up, Lizzie? Whoop! Other way. Can you turn around? Can you turn around? Oh, okay. I saw this. Now, he's preaching, and I'm seeing this. And I looked at that, and I thought, of course, it's the other way. The hands are going up. And I looked at that, and I thought, oh, my God, that's my road. 
I, had, I didn't have pal- pylons or whatever they're called underneath me. I said, I looked at that, and I said, oh, thank you, Jesus. And so I looked down to write it, to draw it. I looked down to draw it, and then all of a sudden, when I looked up, it was gone. So I quick um, I, uh, talked to Orietta, and I asked her, I said, Can, I need to talk to um, uh, Amanda. I need her to sketch me something. And so I went to the house. I gave her the testimony, and this is what she was seeing, which, what, which is what I saw. Mm-hmm. And she sketched that. Mm-hmm. And I thanked her for it, and I thanked Lizzie for making the slide so I could put it up there. And yesterday when I was meditating on this, I put my hands on it, and Father God spoke to me, and he said, I made you a road. I had Jesus hold it up, and I had the Holy Spirit guide you over it. Amen. As you allow yourself to think about what she was sharing for a period of time, each time the devil came back to her probably with the same thing. How many of you know you have an enemy? I'm really trying to get you awakened, church, and this is why we talk about why you ought to pray always. Not to treat prayer like it's some type of pastime. Not to look at your pastor when he says, come and pray like, you know, What the heck for? Because many times, a lot of these things that are happening miraculously for people is because the prayers of the righteous are availing much. And there are things that you need to be doing absolutely in that moment. And in that moment, it's not panic. In that moment, it is Praise in that moment, it is prayer in that moment, it is allowing yourself to be so filled with the Word of God Amen. that nothing comes out of you but the Word of God. Amen. See, Jesus saturated himself, folks. When he sat with those people for a while, at that moment in time, Jesus just began to just saturate himself, just saturate himself, saturate himself to the point he realized, This is who I am. So you got to know who you are in Christ Jesus. Most people are just going through motion. They're just coming to church. And then there are those who come to church and say, I don't need to sit and hear anything. I know this. I've heard this. I don't care how many times you hear the word. If you hear it, it is going to enlighten you and you ain't a man. Faith comes by what? Hearing. Faith comes by what? Hearing. Faith comes by what? Hearing. Don't ever get to the point where you feel you have heard enough. You haven't. Because the moment that you feel like you have heard enough is when the devil is going to come at you in the strongest way. Jesus realized, I've got to really saturate myself with prayer. And for 40 days, he just that's what he did. Just pray. And the bird says, pray without ceasing. So it becomes just a part of you. You get up in the morning and you just know, I need to what? Pray. Look, even if it's not, the, as we would say, the first thing you do, you've got to have an hour in your day where you just pray. Brother, can you not tarry for what? You think that was just for those that, that, that went with him to the garden? And, and you know what happened? As soon as pressure came in that garden, what happened? Everybody just running. Some of them all jacked up, pulling out knives and cutting people's ears off. Is it why? Wasn't prayed up. So some we, we retaliate and we, we, we get to doing things in a natural, you know, and I'll go gangster on you. You don't need to go gangster on nobody. Now I'm going to shut them down. You ain't going to shut nobody down when it's the devil coming at you. 
Quran is going to shut it down. Because God's going to show you by the Spirit things to come. Do you know that God showed Jesus things to come? Jesus even had to learn how he was going to exit. You might say this, Jesus had to, Jesus learned how he was going to die. Pastor, you're just talking out your head now, huh? No, I'm not. Go to Luke chapter 9. Go to Luke chapter 9. Find it in your Bibles real quick. Luke, Luke chapter 9. I've got a, I've got a scurry. Luke chapter 9, verses 28 through 31. Put it up on the screen for me as quick as you can. Amy? In verse 28, it says, About eight days later, Jesus took Peter, James, and John up on a mountain to do what? I want you to get this. It's a lot of us say we want to be like Jesus. But if you find yourself really being like Jesus, you're going to find yourself as a person of prayer. Prayer is not going to be a burden to you. Prayer is not going to be something that's going to be an inconvenience to you. Prayer is going to be something that you know is what takes you through to the next level. And so, verse 29, and as he was praying, the appearance of his face was transformed, and his clothes became what? Dazzling white. Go on down now with me. Verse 30, then two men. He don't give us no chance to try to be guessing about it. Who was it? Moses and Elijah appeared and began what? Talking with Jesus. Everybody say, this is the gospel. gospel. Say it again. This is the gospel. gospel. Let's go on now. Verse 31. And, and, And they were glorious to see. And they were speaking about what? This exodus from this world, which was about to be fulfilled in Jerusalem. Jesus was learning how he was going to exit. It's a Greek word, odos, where we get this word, exodus. Some translations put the word die, but really it's he was going to exit. The devil couldn't take him out. You've got to realize that too. The devil can't take you out. God's got an appointed day and an appointed time for you. You ought to know it. You can know it. You should know it. So no matter whether the truck runs you off the road, say, this ain't my day. This is the day that the Lord has made. I'm going to be rejoicing in it. I'm going to be rejoicing over the enemy. I'm going to be stepping on his head rather than him taking me out today. Look, every day, I don't know if you know it, the devil gets up with the mindset he's going to take you out. Come on, you hear the scripture, but do you apply it when it says the devil has come in your life, but to what? To kill, to steal, and to destroy. Don't ever forget that. Don't ever get up any morning without realizing that you have an enemy that wants to kill you, steal something from you, literally destroy you. But God is going to surround you with his favor like a shield. No weapons formed against you is going to what? Prosper. Didn't say that the weapons are not going to be formed, but they won't prosper. And yet we are around here thinking that, look, I can do this academically. I think I know what to do. Even Jesus himself is telling you, I didn't know until I went and got into my father's presence. I didn't know until I take some mountaintop experience. I didn't know. I didn't know. This is my heart as a pastor watching, and I watch generation after generation. And sometimes I look at generation and I feel like I can't tell them anything, can I? They just know. I, I, I think about like with the father when his son says, give me my inheritance. And I think the father is saying, I can't tell him anything, can I? And so he gives him a portion of it. He says, here, take this portion. I'd rather for you just go ahead and take this portion and to stay here all disgruntled, all upset, all mad with me. Go ahead and take this portion. He takes that portion, and you know what happened. He did not know. He didn't know that people will leave you. 
He didn't know that when it all runs out, when they pulled on you and drained you, see you. He didn't know. He didn't know that God's got something great for you if you learn how to wait on it. If you learn how to wait on it. And the one thing I love about Jesus, what he shows me, he knew how to wait on his father. That's why we go and just pray and say, I'm going to go, I'm going to pray, and God's going to speak to me. He's up there praying. What happened? God sends Moses and Elijah. Go talk to him. Tell him he's getting closer to this time now. See, everything has a timing to it. Everything with God has a timing to it. And I'm, I'm telling you, I, I, I've shared this oftentimes. I said, Chuck Swindoll put one of the nuggets in my life that made a tremendous difference. Chuck Swindoll started out as a praise and worship leader. And Chuck Swindoll was really gifted in his, his ability to speak, and everybody was saying, Chuck, you need to be a pastor. Chuck, you need to be a pastor. Chuck, you need to be a pastor. And he says, and I went out there and I did it. But I did it because I had a lot of feedback coming in my ear. And here's what he said. And as a matter of fact, I used the same pattern for my life. He said, if I had known what I know now, I would have took 25 years in preparation. I wonder this got out there because he says, I got out there and man, I got hurt. I really got hurt. He's a great man of God. Matter of fact, and the most listened to, they will tell you, is Billy Graham, and the second most listened to is Chuck Swindoll. I would have taken. And I look at Jesus. How many years did Jesus take in preparation? Growing in wisdom. Growing in stature. Growing in favor with God. Growing in how to be able to what, step up and elevate so that when you meet things, they don't overtake you. I've known Deline for a long time. And I know this. I know she is a woman of prayer. I know this. Sometimes I would go and it was like, man, your whole house has been decorated in the scripture. And she's just stickies everywhere. I watch her children. I watch Faith when she was growing up. And I remember the first car that got Faith got. I got in there. Faith was going to take me to lunch, I believe, one day. You know, Come on. You know, ride in my car. It's like, okay. It's just a car, but okay, let's ride. And I got in there, and these are index cars are all over Faith's car. With scripture after scripture after scripture after scripture. Until she was what? Going to get it in her. See, some of us, you, you, it's wonderful. And it's needful to come to church, to come to a place like this. But it's much more needful that when you leave here, that you don't throw your Bible in the back seat. Use your phone only now for texting and Facebook and Instagram and Twitter and whatever other platform. You now get into the Word so that the Word can get into you. Pastor is not working. The Word will work if you work the Word. The Word will work. Just like it worked for the lean, just like it worked for Jesus, just like it's worked for me and many of you who have testimony. This word works, but you've got to work the word. Jesus is learning. He's even learning how he's going to die. He takes it to heart. Now he can go back and talk to his disciples. Now he can go back and tell them that they need to get ready, that they need to get prepared for what God is about to do. How many of you realize that when you're not prayed up, all you're going to do is just run and hide when trouble comes? All you're going to do is just cry and talk about, woe is me, woe is me. And when the disciples had gotten to a place like that, Jesus steps into the room where they are at. Literally doesn't even open the door. The Bible says he just comes through the door. And you remember what the scripture says, and he breathes on them. Matter of fact, when I look at that, I go always go back to Genesis 1 and 2. When the earth was void and without form, 
the Spirit of God was hovering. Jesus came and hovered, and, and, and literally that's what was happening on the, the, what we call the creation. The Spirit began to move. And Jesus realized, these, my children, are not moving by the Spirit right now. They're moving by their emotions. They're moving by fear. They're moving by a lot of things, but it's not the Spirit. And so he comes and he breathes on them the breath of life, his consciousness. A consciousness that this you walk by faith and not by sight. This you walk by direction of the Spirit, not by direction of your emotions, your feelings. And as a church, as a body of believers, as a body of Christ, you elevate every time that you stop leaning to your own understanding and start acknowledging God when it comes to your marriage, when it comes to your finances, when it comes to your children, when it comes to your life, when it comes to your job, when it comes to your children going to school. A lot of us, and I'm going to say this, and I've been in conversations concerning this, all of us are we're pushing our children into places that are nothing going to be nothing but a cesspool of sin, a mountain of debt, a mountain of despair. Because we're not looking at it by the Spirit. We're doing it by, you know, Tom, Dick, and Harry saying, oh, this is a good school. Well, what did God say? Don't you want to get God's... Don't you want to get something of God? Whenever you come in and say, Pastor, do you know of any good biblical schools my children can get into? Because there are some wonderful schools that our children ought to be in that will keep them close to God. And there are some places that you can push your children, talking about, oh, these are the best schools in the world. These are the best schools to allow your child to lose sight of Jesus Christ. Do you know that there are schools that really relish and appreciate the titles of being party schools? Google right now. Some of you go ahead. Google top 10 party colleges or universities. And you're going to be surprised what's popping up. And some of you are saying, well, that's where I want my child to go to school at. Have you really been prayerful about it? Have you really been prayerful about it? Because if you're prayerful about it, God's going to tell you, mm -mm, that's not where I want them. So look, your child can be successful going to Montgomery County Community College is coming out. When God's in it. When God's in it. It doesn't have to be Harvard. It doesn't have to be Yale. It doesn't have to be this Ivy League or that Ivy League or this. It's got to be, where is that child going to fulfill what God has created them to be? And while I'm there, I might as well just tell you, college ain't for everybody. There are just as many wonderful vocational directions that children can go in. But if you're not prayerful about it, you are in the mindset of the world that says, i got to go this way in order to be successful. Well, people are about to go to jail because they did all kind of crazy things to get their children in the so-called best schools. They're about to go to jail. Someone will still try to buy their way out of that, but they're about to go to jail for some of the things that they're doing, the so-called best school. The best school is the one that you hear God on. Amen? I'm going to stop here. I'm not finished, but I'm going to stop here. I want you to see some things. You know, we're going to go into Resurrection Sunday next week, and I want you to, I'm going to be right here, guys. I'm going to be right here where God told me to go. And you're going to see some things after resurrection that God is doing. Some things that he wants you to understand after resurrection. The resurrection is wonderful, but he wants you to understand what happens now that a resurrected Christ has been risen up. What happens in your life now? What is supposed to happen in your life? One of the first things for me is 
what I just finished talking about, and this is where we'll pick up next week. He breathed on them. And all of us need God to breathe on us. All of us need God to breathe on us. Those 40 days after the resurrection, you know what he ha happened? He said, you ought to go into a place, and you ought to spend some time up there. And then what happened? God breathed on them. The Bible is described as like a mighty rushing wind that came, but God was breathing on them. You want God to breathe on you before you take another step. There were two men that were going to a village called Emmaus. Do you realize what God did with them? you never realize what Jesus did with them? What takes you to the next level is the Holy Ghost taking you to the Word. Because in those two men walking to Emmaus, the Bible says Jesus walked with them. And they didn't recognize that. That was Jesus walking with them, taking them back to the Word again. And it said, after they had he taken them from the beginning to the end, and they said, did not our hearts burn when he opened up what? The scripture. See, in life, folks, you, you, just, just, you can't hide the scripture from yourself or from others. It's the scripture that makes the difference. It's the word of God. That elevates you. So if you're trying to figure out where's pastor going with this message, I'm going to this place where I'm saying to you, what are you doing that you can tell me the word says it? What are you working on in your life that says the word says that? What are you working on in your marriage that says the word says that? What are you working on with your children that says, and the word the word. The word, not you. The word, even in your mouth. The word. What's going to pass away? Everything. What's going to remain? See, and a lot of times we're working on everything else but the Word. Why can't I do this? Well, I'm, you know, I'm doing this and I'm doing that and I'm doing that. Do you realize that's going to pass away? What are you doing in relationship to the Word, though? The Word. Go ahead and stand.